For the many women who climb all the way up the ladder but still can't quite crack that glass ceiling, it is time for the workplace to pay up. That's the title of author and activist Reshma Sujani's new book, which addresses the burnout and inequity harming working women today. Sujani sat down with Hari Srinivasan to discuss the ongoing misconceptions around feminism in the office. Christian, thanks. Reshma Sajani, thanks so much for joining us. What's the last couple of years been like for moms? What does the data show us? I mean, the data shows us that we are burnt out and exhausted. You know, when we started the pandemic, you know, our mental health was in a good place, but now it's in the toilet. You know, we've seen the severe amount of job loss. You know, that's not even accounting for the amount of women who have downshifted their careers. You know, I had women who say to me, you know, I was studying to be a nurse. I was saving up to do that. And now I had to like put that dream aside and I'm Uber driving right now just to pay the rent. They're exhausted, they're tired. And all they want is some help, some recognition that they've fulfilled a, a patriotic duty over the past two years by keeping their families together and thereby keeping this country together. So they just wanna be seen. They just wanna be respected. They wanna be valued. And I don't think that that's a lot to ask for in this moment. It's the right thing to do. You point out that according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, at the end of 2019, women actually had more payroll jobs. And despite things that are still structurally unequal, there were so many women in the workforce. Now, insert pandemic. What happens? Yeah, I mean, we start the pandemic with 51% of the labor force. And then, you know, we have the pandemic. And what I know what happened for me and so many moms is that, you know, when schools closed, you know, that was really the breaking point for so many women because so many families use schools as, as daycare. So now schools are closed. Half of daycare centers are shut down. You can't rely on your elderly parents who may have been helping you kind of put it together. And so you have no safety net and, and, you, and you're homeschooling your kid while you're trying to maintain your full-time job. And so this was the breaking point for so many women. And you literally saw millions of women exit the workforce. You know, our labor market participation, you know, in that December of 2020 was back where it was in 1989. And we still haven't recovered. And so I wrote an op-ed. I said, we need a Marshall Plan for moms because it feels like we got blown out cities. And when I talked to the moms in my PTA, you know, what we needed was pretty basic. You know, we needed paid leave. The United States is the only industrialized nation that doesn't offer paid leave. We needed affordable childcare. Most Americans pay more for their childcare than their mortgage. You know, we needed schools to open up safely. You know, we needed women who had lost their jobs in the pandemic. If you think about so many women, so many women of color, they were working in retail, education, healthcare, jobs that were automated you know, because of the pandemic. And there was no national retraining program to help them get back to work. Even though almost half of families, the, the sole breadwinner are women. So when you know, they lose their jobs, the entire family, you know, uh, falls into poverty. And, you know, finally, we needed to get compensated for our unpaid labor. And you know, part of the problem, Hari, is that two thirds of the caretaking work, the domestic work is done by women. So before you even start your job, you've done two and a half jobs. And so we're constantly negotiating, doing all of this unpaid labor with doing all the paid labor that we do. And it's untenable. And it's not like that in other countries. What was that moment where you kind of had your reckoning? Because you talk about the fact that, look, you are one of the lucky ones who had support, who has a husband who was trying to help, who had childcare. When did it become too much? You know, I found myself in the pandemic. I had just had my second child, Sai. Uh, I was, have, you know, a kindergartner at home. I was running the largest women and girls organization in the world. And so here I am trying to save my nonprofit, take care of my newborn, you know, homeschool my six-year-old. And we're in the middle of the pandemic when all I want to do is keep my family alive. And so I looked at my leadership team, which was mostly female, you know, of working parents, you know, with little kids. And there was just no support. And I think so for so many of us, we were just trying to hang on. And I think this feeling that I think that for the school closures for me, Hari, the way they made that decision, 
you know, America has time and use surveys. And so we kind of knew in March, April, May, who was doing the homeschooling, who was balancing their job, full-time jobs with full-time caretaking. We knew it was women. And so when we knew to close the schools and to do it in a way, again, as a kindergartner, I couldn't just be like, hey, Sean, log yourself on to Zoom while I take this call. Like I had to be there and do it with him. And so we knew that women were gonna have to do that. And we still did it without even a thought to the ramifications on their life. And now women are in crisis. Two years later, Hari, you know, 51% of mothers say they're anxious and depressed. You know, the CDC released a report saying the two subgroups that are suffering from the most anxiety and depression are young people and moms. Moms don't break, but we are broken now because the past two years have broken us. You know, we once again have an opportunity in, in Washington right now uh, to get childcare as part of the package. You know, 66% of Americans say like it matters to them, you know, in swing states, it matters to them whether their congressional official is going to be supporting child care. So, you know, we have got to keep fighting in this moment and pushing our, our elected officials, Republican and Democrat, to do the right thing because moms are watching. And I promise you, you will pay the price in the ballot box if you do not pass child care. Employers, some of them are going to come back and say, look, we've increased our working from home flexibility, but you're saying that's not all the flexibility that you're asking for. It's a different type of empowerment. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a wholesale rebuilding of the workforce. You know, we built workplaces for, you know, a man who had a stay at home partner. We didn't build workplaces for a single mom, a woman of color. And you always should build for the most vulnerable. I certainly did that for Girls Who Code. And I think the opportunity here is, you know, yesterday we, re we released a report, you know, with McKinsey, you know, making the case that childcare is a business issue. And we released a National Business Childcare Coalition of companies who get it because we're still in the throes of the great resignation. Four million are quitting every month. And we surveyed a thousand parents. And half of the women who left the workforce during the pandemic left because of childcare. So if you want to get women back and you want to get women back in a way that they just not do they just, you know, thrive, survive, but they thrive, you got to support them with childcare. We have to pay for childcare, subsidize it, offer childcare benefits. You know, we offer museum memberships and we pay for people's IVF, but we got to pay for their childcare. Along with paying for childcare, what does that reimagined workplace look like when it is not designed around a man? Right, you know, like I said, it includes childcare. It includes flexibility and remote working. You know, Hari, work days are nine to five, but school days are eight to three. That doesn't make sense. You know, in this day and age, again, where you need two people, you know, when you have a and when you have two-person families to basically be participating in the workforce. So we got to rethink that. We have to think about the execution of paid leave. It's not enough for companies just to tout that they offer paid leave. But the question that they have to be asking themselves are, are they encouraging or in, even incentivizing men to take it too? You know, I know so many dads, and here's the thing, people always say to me, Rashma, how, how, how do men feel about pay up? What's the response from them? And I always say, they're with me too. They want the exact same things. So many dads over the past two years, you know, they didn't have to commute two hours, you know, a day to work. So they got to take their son to school. They got to play soccer with them. They got to take care of them. And it felt good. And we know that when men engage in caretaking work, you know, it lowers their rate of diabetes, of heart attacks, right? It's good for them. And so, but so many dads I talk to, they're gaslit at work when they take paid leave or they when they too want to you know fight for flexibility in remote work and so we have to stop that we need corporate policies that actually encourage and incentivize men to be part of the care you know the caretaking structure you know our goal for every company should say how do i get my employees to get to 50 50 percent of domestic work at home how do i create corporate policies that are in, going to incentivize that caretaking work rather than penalize it because right now, many companies actually penalize men when they participate in caretaking work. You also take um, you know, pains to say, hey, listen, we have laws on the books so that there is not 
discrimination against women or against moms or pregnancies. But there is still anti-bias that happens, anti-mom bias that happens in the workplace. Absolutely. I mean, think about the pay gap. You know, we love to think about the pay gap as a gender gap, but it's not. It's a motherhood penalty. You know, the pay gap is between mothers and fathers in the workforce. In fact, the largest pay gap is between childless women and moms. You know, right now in 22 states, women, childless women are making more than men. That's amazing. But that is not what the, what the pay gap, what the gender pay gap is about. Every company should literally go in and you know, audit their payroll to see where they are punishing mothers for being mothers and root it out. You know, when you're a mom and you take one year off, you, know, you lose 40% of your income. And, and this is, I mean, so many moms who had to downshift their careers or take a break again this, the past two years because they had to supplement you know, their paid labor for unpaid labor are gonna pay a price when they re-enter the workforce. And so this is, this is fixable, you know, this is solvable, but, but yes, you know, while we do have some legal protections, we still do not have protections against mothers who are doing caretaking. Like you can still get fired for that. One of the ideas that you put forward, um, both in your memo a while back and in the book is trying to value a dollar figure value the work that is happening at home. And it's worth, you know, $800 billion. Oxfam did, you know, a, a survey that basically indicates that Melinda Gates has talked about this, that women do two and a half jobs uh, of unpaid labor. So, you know, that is work. You know, when you are cooking and cleaning and figuring out whether the diaper bag is packed and making sure you have your doctor's appointments, all of that is cognitive labor, a mental load that so many of us carry on top of doing the full-time job that we're doing. You know, right now, Hari, we have the lowest birth rate in 50 years. So many young women look at me and they say, no, thank you. And they don't wanna have kids because it's not affordable. It's not respected. And so other nations have something called the parental income. The UK has it, Canada has it, of course the Swedes have it. And so when you have a child, you get a check from the government because that's acknowledging that that work is work. You know, we had this in the form of the child tax credit until we let it expire and put over 40 million kids in poverty. You know, in this country, we do not value, we like to say we're a country of family values. No, we're not. We don't value parenting. We don't value caretaking. We think it's a personal problem that you have to solve. That's why there's so much resistance from the policy sector, you know, against, again, having affordable childcare, passing paid leave, you know, making sure that we have a child tax credit. There's so much resistance to that. You know, Joe Manchin says, that's not work. You should only get a child tax credit if you are working in the workplace as if the work that I do at home is not work. And that's the shift that we have to make. What do you think the prospect is, even in the Biden administration, for getting some of the things that you're asking for done? Look, I'm going to keep fighting to the you know very last second, and we have a, an opportunity you know right now to get child care you know in, in in a reconciliation bill, and I know there's two senators that are really fighting hard for that, but but the reality is is that I think that elected officials have made it clear that moms, women are not a priority you know, are not something that they put front and center. Our, our, our labor, you know, our mental health does not have value for them. And it's an indication for me as an activist, you know, as a mother that, that we have to fight, that we have to turn our rage into power. You know, we see this with what's happened, you know, with abortion. Six out of 10 women who get an abortion are mothers. Half of them are mothers who already have two children. The reason why we need control over our, our reproductive rights is because we live in a country, you know, that rather force birth than offer paid leave, affordable childcare, you know? And so this is all interconnected and we have to see it as interconnected and we have to keep fighting and pushing. And, you know, we, in 2022, we have not made the progress that I would have hoped that we would have made. You know, for a long time, I was shocked. I thought that the first bill that they would pass is paid leave. The first bill they would have passed is childcare, but it's not a priority. 
but you know, again, until until it's over, over, we have to keep fighting for it. But I am turning to the private sector and asking them to step up, you know, while we wait and fight for our government to do the right thing. Are you optimistic? Am I optimistic? No, I'm heartbroken. Do you think that the private sector will step up and fill this gap? Or will we have another sort of patchwork where companies that have the means will try to do better and most companies that don't won't because there is no regulatory framework that incentivizes or penalizes them? Look, I think the opportunity is, is that we're in a talent war and companies are desperate to fill those to, to fill those jobs. And again, people keep leaving and they're not leaving because they don't want to work. They're leaving because they don't want to work for you and they're shopping. You know, that's what we found in our survey with McKinsey is that they're looking, they're literally shopping. 70% of women that had children under the age of five said that whether the company offers childcare is, is a huge factor for them. And they would go work for a company that did over one that did it. So I think companies are recognizing this. And this is why, you know, as we've launched our national business childcare coalition, you know, we've gotten so much, we've gotten so many companies to stand up you know, who are doing incredible things. And so again, when we announced this yesterday in the New York Times, like we were like overwhelmed with the response of companies being like, me too, sign me up. I'm doing this. I'm thinking about doing this. How do I figure this out? Because there's alignment, you know, there's alignment in terms of what companies need to do for business reasons and what parents actually need. So I have a lot of faith and listen, I know, you know me, like I'm on a mission to make sure every single company in the next three to five years is offering some sort of childcare benefit because that's the only way that we get to equality. Childcare is at the center of it. And you know, far, far too often, you know, we have women just make unconscionable choices that is not right. You know, I think about my mother, you know, I was the daughter of, of refugees and my, my mom couldn't afford the $50 a week for childcare. So I was a latchkey kid from the time I was 10 years old. And my sister would pick me up at my middle school and we would literally just run home, go in the house, lock the door. And I think about how my mother felt every day at 345, thinking about the fact that her babies had to go home and take care of themselves, the fear that she had. So many parents are making unconscionable choices because they have to work because they want to work, because they need to work. So why are we making it so hard for them? It doesn't make sense. The book is called Pay Up, The Future of Women and Work and Why It's Different Than You Think, author Rachel Sojani. Thanks so much. Thank you for having me.